Hello, and welcome to TOPS, Tobacco Online Policy Seminar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Sam Sturm, a fourth year economics PhD student at Georgia State University. TOPS is organized by Mike Pesco at University of Missouri, C. Shang at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at John Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. The seminar today will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website at tobaccopolicy.org. I will now turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Jamie Hartman Boyce from University of Massachusetts Amherst to introduce our speaker. Hi everyone, great to see so many of you here today. We're gonna to continue our winter spring 2024 season with a single paper presentation by Christian Signs entitled Pharmaceutical Drug Regulation and Mortality, The Peculiar Case of E-Cigarettes. This presentation was selected via a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Christian Sines is a fourth year PhD student in the economics department at Georgia State University. His fields of interest include health and public economics. His research interests include studying health related risky behaviors, including alcohol and substance abuse and addiction more broadly. Christian's job market paper studies the long run effect of alcohol taxes and minimal legal drinking age laws on chronic alcohol abuse and mortality in order to better understand how alcoholism develops over the course of a person's life cycle. Christian previously earned his BS in psychology from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Dr. Michael Pasco, a professor of economics at the University of Missouri, is a co-author of the studies and will answer select questions in the Q&A. Our discussant today is Michael Darden from Johns Hopkins University. Christian Sines, over to you. Thanks so much for presenting for us today. Uh, thank you very much. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> okay. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Christian Sines. I'm a fourth year PhD student at Georgia State University in the Econ Department. Uh, today I'll be presenting joint work uh, with Mike Pesco at University of Missouri, uh, looking at the effect of e-cigarettes on mortality. Uh, this research is funded by a grant from the National Institute of Drug Abuse at the NIH. Uh, other than that, we have no tobacco-related funding uh, to report. So in the United States, the FDA is the agency responsible for regulating pharmaceutical drugs. Um, one of their responsibilities is also approving new drugs that come to market. The FDA approval process uh, is very lengthy. Uh, costly and highly uncertain. Uh, it also involves ex expensive post-market surveillance um, and imposes high regulatory barriers as well. Uh, so if a company wants to make even a, a very small change to a product uh, that has already been approved by the FDA, that, that process can be very lengthy uh, just for even small changes. Uh, one data point is that the average time that it takes to uh, bring a new pharmaceutical compound to market is 15 years, uh, and almost half that time is spent just on preparing the original application uh, to the FDA. In addition, uh, this process is expensive for companies. Um, a study by uh, Demasi in 2016 found that firms spend an average of almost $3 billion dollars uh, including post-approval monitoring just to bring a new uh, drug or compound to market. In addition, uh, only 12%, 11.8% of new compounds approved for human subjects are even approved for marketing. So when we think about FDA drug regulation, uh, the way we should think about it is as a trade-off between safety and efficacy, wanting to bring new compounds to market that are safe and, and effective, uh, 
but there's a trade-off here with speed. Uh, there could be uh, compounds and drugs that are safe and effective, but it takes a long time uh, for them to be approved. Uh, and so there is a trade-off here um, in terms of social welfare or uh, life years gained. Um, consumer surplus could potentially be enhanced by bringing uh, compounds and new drugs to the market sooner, um, but that involves some kind of risk. Um, there's a chance that some of these compounds could be safe or ineffective um, and could have benefited from longer approval times. Um, a number of studies have looked at one aspect of FDA regulation and the approval process uh, to determine how uh, the average drug review time, the time it takes for a new compound to be approved, how does that impact a number of outcomes? Uh, and so studies have found that uh, faster review times at the FDA uh, tend to have no effect on average on adverse events. Uh, faster review times also tend to increase firm R&D expenditures. Uh, so compounds going to market sooner tends to increase the uh, amount of money that firms spend on trying to come out, come out with uh, new compounds. Uh, faster review times also increase uh, the number of compounds in development and increase market entry. Uh, lastly, the 1992 Prescription Drug User Fee Act, uh, one component of which reviewed or reduced the uh, amount of time it takes for uh, drugs to be approved by the FDA. A uh, study by Philipson found that, that just by reducing uh, approval times, uh, that this increased social surplus by between 14 and 31 billion uh, per year uh, with an upper bound of life years loss of 56,000 um, compared to other measures of consumer surplus. This is comparatively small. And so uh, the takeaway from this study is that, that by allowing drugs to come to the market faster, uh, the uh, benefits might outweigh the costs. So these studies that I uh, talked about in the previous slide, they tend to analyze just one small aspect of FDA drug regulation, which is the amount of time it takes for a drug to be approved. Uh, but this is just one aspect of, of, of uh, FDA regulation. And so the larger question we're interested in uh, from a policy point of view is, is how does FDA regulation writ large impact consumer welfare and, and mortality. And so in this paper, we, we evaluate a single uh, quote unquote drug, um, at least one that the FDA tried to claim was a drug, uh, e-cigarettes, which entered the US in 2007. Um, and e-cigarettes, unlike other compounds that uh, fall under the FDA's purview, uh, E-cigarettes managed to escape FDA drug regulation due to uh, an unexpected change in federal law in 2009. Uh, and so as a result, e-cigarettes were virtually unregulated at the federal level for almost a decade uh, because of this change in the law. And so our research question uh, in this paper is, is what is the impact of, of introducing e-cigarettes to the US market on mortality and social welfare. Uh, and we compare our results for e-cigarettes to a more traditional uh, tobacco product, uh, nicotine uh, replacement therapy, uh, nicotine gum and patches. Uh, and we compare the effect of e-cigarettes to this, uh, this NRT, uh, which has been very heavily regulated by the FDA. Uh, since the 1980s, unlike e-cigarettes. And so by comparing the, the effect of, of e-cigarettes to NRT, we, we want to be able to say something about uh, a world pre-1938 before the FDA uh, was created. Uh, so in other words, we want a glimpse into a modern day world without FDA drug regulation. And, and e-cigarettes provide a 
a somewhat clean opportunity for us to, to look at how mortality would be affected in the absence of this kind of uh, regulation from the FDA. So a little bit of background um, on e-cigarettes. So in August 2006, the uh, first e-cigarette that we were able to find, uh, the Royan V8, uh, began being imported to the U.S. Uh, in March of 2009, uh, the FDA, under the Obama administration, began uh, being much more aggressive against the e-cigarette industry. Uh, so the Obama FDA declared e-cigarettes to be unapproved uh, drugs or unapproved drug delivery devices, uh, sort of like the nicotine patch, uh, and began seizing them at, at ports of entry. And so the FDA was sued. Uh, shortly after by two e-cigarette companies uh, who challenged the declaration declaration by the FDA that e-cigarettes were a drug and they uh, requested an injunction against seizures. Uh, and the FDA's position at the time was that they had the right to declare any tobacco product as a drug uh, unless the federal government uh, declared the product as a tobacco product through legislation. Uh, and so this was the FDA's position that they argued in court. And then this is a picture of uh, the Royan V8, the first e-cigarette uh, that was imported to the U.S. Uh, in 2006, uh, which looks a lot different from probably the modern day uh, versions of e-cigarettes. So shortly after these lawsuits started, uh, in 2009, uh, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Act, the TCA, was signed into law. Uh, and the TCA gave the FDA new authority to regulate existing tobacco products, uh, as well as a pathway to regulate new products if the FDA deemed them to be tobacco products through the rulemaking process. Uh, however, one of the unintended consequences of this bill, um, of this piece of legislation, was that it actually hurt the FDA's argument in court uh, that e-cigarettes were a drug and that the FDA could declare them as such. Uh, the reason this bill hurt that argument is that Congress had now passed this new piece of legislation uh, that effectively said that new tobacco products uh, like e-cigarettes could be regulated as tobacco products, uh, even if Congress had not explicitly uh, passed a piece of legislation uh, legislating them as tobacco products. And so the bottom line here is that uh, the district court ended up siding with industry uh, and said that the FDA has to regulate e-cigarettes as a tobacco product and, and not a drug, which is what the FDA was trying to do. And so after this happened, um, FDA obviously tried to uh, do what they failed to do before. And so they began the process of deeming e-cigarettes as tobacco products. Uh, and they succeeded uh, almost seven years later in 2016. Uh, Although even after 2016, it took a number of years before this uh, was actually finalized. So it was almost a decade in which e-cigarettes uh, were pretty much unregulated at the federal level. Uh, so 10 years after their initial importation in 2006. Um, and so as a result, the this e-cigarette industry really exploded. Um, we saw a lot of innovation, new uh, companies entering the market and so forth um, without all the burdens of, of regulation. Uh, and descriptively, this, this is a graph of, of how e-cigarettes uh, change, uh, search interest changed over time. And so we have e-cigarettes as the blue line, uh, NRT as the red line, uh, prescription pills as the green line. Uh, and we see that after 2010, uh, e-cigarette search interest really just exploded, although it was uh, increasing before 2010. Uh, in contrast, NRT is a product that's been uh, very heavily regulated since the 1980s. 
uh, that has evolved very slowly and had almost no innovation. Uh, it took almost nine years before a new type of gum was approved above two milligram nicotine strength uh, over a decade before it could be sold over the counter uh, and almost 15 years before it could be sold, uh, nicotine gum could be sold with a flavor uh, as well. And so this is kind of the polar opposite type of, of product that like e-cigarettes deliver nicotine, but is very heavily regulated by, by the FDA. So I think, um, well, let me do this slide and then we'll do the first pause uh, for any questions. So the paper in one slide, uh, the, the big picture question we're interested in is what are the public health benefits or harms from FDA drug regulation deregulation? Uh, and the specific question we try to look at in this paper is, is how do e-cigarettes and over-the-counter NRT impact mortality for groups that report high smoking prevalence relative to groups that report low smoking prevalence. Uh, and the data we use is restricted use uh, mortality data from the National Vital Statistics System uh, and data from the Burfus. Um, our estimation strategy is a uh, bite-style difference and difference model in event study design. Uh, our bottom line result, and probably the most notable result, is that uh, we find that e-cigarettes saved roughly 1.7 million life years uh, from 2007 to 2019, or roughly 13.3 billion in uh, annual consumer surplus per year. Uh, and we find no such, no similar effect for NRT uh, on life years gained. Uh, we also find that e-cigarettes reduce smoking and NRT does not. So let me pause here. Uh, for any questions. Thank you so much. I love that paper in one slide summary and it makes me excited for what's to come. I wanna first invite our discussant, Michael Darden for any comments he might have at this stage. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so so Christian and Mike have a, have a really interesting paper here. Um, a very important topic obviously and we have, we have so little information really on how e-cigarettes are kind of affecting health in the long run. And so this is very exciting. Um, I have a ton of questions about the kind of data estimation and results section. So um, maybe we could just go through this. I'll just ask one question right now and, and save for more questions for later. But um, uh, how, so so I think I, think I understand the, the big picture question here, um, but how is it that, uh, is the claim is the claim that in the absence of regulation, these for-profit companies for things like uh, nicotine patches would have innovated in such a way that was you know that 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 would have generated a lot more substitution or or quitting in this case away from cigarettes and towards these nicotine replacement therapies, um, and because of the regulation, and because of the nicotine caps. Uh, that didn't happen. Is that is that essentially what's being claimed here? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair um, description of the the larger um, claim that we're making in this paper. So, so I mean, do you have any issues with like I mean, nicotine replacement therapy and e-cigarettes are not quite the same thing, though, right? Right. So, like uh, e-cigarettes confer these kind of social benefits. Uh, the nicotine levels are higher, um, you know, uh, for-profit companies are targeting young people with them. Uh, so um, I, I, I'm not sure that e-cigarettes e and, and um, patches are kind of directly comparable on a lot of the dimensions you care about. Can you maybe comment about that? Yeah, that, that's a good point. And it it's not strictly an apples to apples comparison between e-cigarettes and NRT. Um, we do think that there are a lot of parallels between these two products. Um, they both deliver nicotine. The FDA tried to regulate them both. Um, the FDA failed for e-cigarettes. Um, and so if you imagine a counterfactual world where e-cigarettes 
where the FDA succeeded in regulating e-cigarettes, uh, and what would the effect of that have been? That's kind of the 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 question we're interested in uh, understanding how the lack of of FDA drug regulation of e-cigarettes impacted mortality, and so nicotine replacement therapy over the the counter it, it's not a perfect uh, uh, substitute for e-cigarettes. They differ in some ways, but we think it's the most natural um, drug to use to compare uh, simply because they have such such strikingly different regulatory um, regulation that they face. Let me just ask one one question to set up your kind of data and, and estimation section. How, how much are your results going to rely on there being substitution effects between substitution between cigarettes and e-cigarettes? your mortality effects, they're going to rely on that happening, right? In the absence of substitution, we should not see mortality effects in your framework. Is that correct? So we show that mortality declines for groups that smoke more relative to groups that smoke less following e-cigarette introduction. And then we ask, okay, why? So we look at uh, current and everyday smoking prevalence, and we find that both uh, both measures of smoking significantly decline after e-cigarettes. And in the paper, we argue, okay, we observe these mortality reductions. Why do we observe them? It's because people are either uh, quitting uh, cigarettes at higher rates or they're reducing their intensity of smoking. And we think that that's a natural um, explanation for our results. And so I, I guess to answer your question, yes, uh, we we think that smoking cessation is, is is driving a lot of our results. Awesome. I think that cues us up nicely for the next sections. I do know we have a few questions in the Q&A. I think they could be addressed uh, as we go through the materials. And if not, we'll try and come back to them. But in the interest of time, do go ahead and press on. Okay. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about our data. Uh, and so we use data from the Burfus uh, from 1989 to 20. Uh, 20 to create our smoking bite variable. Uh, and so our bite variable, we use the two years prior to e-cigarettes or over-the-counter NRT entering the market. Uh, and we just calculate the, the daily smoking prevalence uh, by demographic uh, group uh, using the Burfus sample weights. Uh, and we consider a uh, very similar uh, demographic variables that uh, is used in the Alcott Rafkin uh, paper looking at e cigarette use. Uh, so we use urban status, uh, five year age, uh, bins, gender, uh, race, ethnicity, uh, and we also include census region. Uh, and so the mean uh, daily smoking rate uh, prior in the two years prior to 2007 is around 12%. Uh, and an average of around uh, over a thousand respondents used to create uh, our e-cigarette bite variable. Uh, and so as an example, uh, one of the highest daily smoking rates uh, is almost a third. Uh, and we see this for 40 to 44 year old American Indian female uh, individuals who live in the South uh, outside of cities. Uh, and one of the lowest daily smoking rates uh, in 2005 and six is uh, 0.16%. Uh, and this is for 70, 74 year old Asian Pacific Islander, female, rural uh, people who live in the West. Uh, and so we have over 960 different uh, demographic groups and we have a smoking uh, prevalence for each of those groups. And we require at least a hundred people uh, in each group in order to calculate uh, the smoking prevalence. And we use the daily smoking rate uh, for our bite variable. And then our data on mortality comes from the National Vital Statistics System from 1989 to 2019. Uh, we create a panel of mortality rates as well as cause specific mortality rates uh, by demographic group. Uh, 28,800 uh, group year observations. And we use the, the smoking attributable ICD codes from, from uh, Laracy 2019 
um, as well to, to create smoking attributable uh, mortality. And then lastly, we go back to the Burfus again. Um, we use Burfus not just to create our smoking bite variable, but um, as we also look at smoking prevalence as an outcome. And so we calculate this the same as before. Um, however, the only difference here is that uh, because we have such a high resolution uh, of demographic groups that we look at over 900 and very specific, um, we are at, at risk of having small uh, cell sizes. And so we, we do want enough people uh, when we calculate this bite variable. And so we just drop census region, uh, which quadruples the number of observations we have uh, for each um, demographic group. Uh, and then we merge the uh, smoking prevalence onto our panel of mortality. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the estimation. Uh, so we use a bite style uh, difference and difference design. Uh, this is similar to uh, what Alcott and Rafkin use in their 2022 paper, um, although a number of papers ha have used this, this strategy. Um, and so our outcome is, is uh, mortality per 100,000 uh, YIT. And our treatment variable here is theta I. This is just the daily smoking prevalence of group I. Uh, so 33%, for example, in the two years prior to uh, either e-cigarettes or NRT uh, entering the market. Uh, we, so that's a typo that should be uh, unit fixed effects, not county fixed effects. Uh, so we control for those as well as year fixed effects. Uh, so we're using within uh, demographic uh, group variation, uh, controlling for the average mortality for each group, uh, as well as common uh, changes over time uh, in mortality. And we estimate this through OLS and weight by population. And so what this equation tells us uh, basically is how the mortality rate uh, for groups that smoke relatively more changes after NRT or e-cigarettes become available uh, relative to groups that smoke less. Uh, and so uh, how the association between, between smoking pre-introduction uh, and mortality is affected by, by the availability of, of NRT or e-cigarettes. Uh, and so the identifying assumption here is that uh, that prior to NRT or e-cigarettes entering the market, it has to be the case that mortality uh, for groups that have high smoking prevalence uh, trends parallel to that of groups with low smoking prevalence. Um, but what we found in our analysis is that this uh, parallel trend assumption uh, is often violated. And so what we find is that mortality tends to increase uh, prior to uh, 2007 uh, for groups that have higher smoking rates uh, compared to low smoking rates. And so to get around this issue uh, so that we can make a causal inference, we uh, use this uh, pre-trend correction uh, procedure by Andrew Goodman and Bacon. Uh, and what this involves is just estimating uh, we regress our outcome, the mortality rate on a linear trend uh, indicator using the pre-period years. And so for each uh, group of people, for our each unit, we estimate how mortality trended in the pre-period years. We take the residual from that regression and we use that as our adjusted outcome. And so instead of looking at uh, mortality in levels, we're now looking at how mortality uh, how deviations in mortality from the uh, pre-period linear trend, how mortality was, was trending for that group, um, how those deviations from that trend change uh, as opposed to just how the levels change over time. And so the bottom line here is that this allows us to uh, satisfy the parallel trend assumption and make a causal inference um, in our event studies. So I think um, this might be a good time for the second pause, and then I'll uh, go over my results. 
Thank you so much. And again, I'll first invite our discussant, Michael Darden. Thanks. Yeah. So um, a really interesting design. Um, I, I want to just kind of press you a little bit um, on what makes you think that the mortality trends by demographic group, groups are going to evolve similarly in the absence of of these of these products. Um, and and you know, I mean, I understand that you're making a correction for pre-trends, but you know, as it says in the paper, you, you know, the identifying assumption is really that the trends would have evolved similarly in the absence of these products in the post period. Um, and specifically, when I think about mortality here and and the kind of 30 and up group, I, I'm thinking about deaths of despair. I'm thinking about declining life expectancy in the US. Um, so I, I guess I'm I'm not sure if I if I buy yet the the idea that these mortality trends would have evolved similarly. Um, can you can you speak to that? Yeah. So this assumption is is similar to your standard diff and diff assumption that that the trend in your outcome and in, in treated versus control uh, groups uh, trends parallel prior to treatment happening. Uh, and so we don't have a treatment and control group here. We just have variation right. in smoking prevalence. And so we need some kind of parallel trend assumption in our uh, our DID model in order to make a causal inference. Uh, we need that flat pre-period in our event studies. Um, and so, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it, it might be slightly implausible that that mortality would trend exactly the same across these groups. Um, but that's part of why we use this procedure. We, we find that it's not the case that, that these groups have, some have mortality that's increasing over time, some are decreasing. We find no trend for other groups. And so we use this procedure to uh, try to remove the all, it doesn't matter how mortality is, is trending for different groups. We, um, we can still say something about the the effect of e-cigarettes on mortality after using this uh, procedure. Um, okay, well, I mean, we can we can talk a little bit more about that in the after uh, in the after party here. But um, I I, uh, I would I would expect to see also, you know, if you if if the if the if the claim here is that innovation is really what's doing this, like e-cigarettes are being innovated on by these for-profit companies and there are four distinct periods in which innovation is occurring. Uh, you know, shouldn't we see more discrete uh, changes around some of these these later edition e-cigarettes? And have you looked, have you done a model in which you allow for that? So uh, effects that vary by when, uh, you know, uh, Juul comes out, for example. So we do event study modeling. Um, and we look at how uh, mortality changes over time. And so I think that's part of what you're asking about is, is if we put a vertical dash line at when Gen 1 came out, at when Gen Generation 2 came out, um, and then we look at our event study and we, we see that, um, that we find larger effects after that generation came out. I, I think we could do something like that um, already using our event studies. Um, but I, I would also say that mortality isn't uh, necessarily an immediately responsive outcome. It could take years before we see an effect. And so it's it's kind of difficult to say, okay, generation two started on this date. Uh, this is how mortality changed. It, it's kind of a little fuzzy uh, how... Uh, e-cigarettes ended up reducing mortality uh, over time. And so we just look at just the reduced form effect uh, in, in the post period, how mortality changed. Um, okay. So I, I guess my last question would just be that, um, you know, you're using this methodology that's very similar to Alcott and Rafkin, right? Where you're looking at different groups and their propensity to smoke, and some should be substituting more than others. In that paper, they found no evidence of substitution. Um, and so they found, in fact, their point estimate was insignificant, but it was indicative of some complementarity between cigarettes and e-cigarettes. So I, I'm just wondering what's different here. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Alcott and Raft can use um, 2013 as their introduction date. Um, we provide evidence in our paper that, that we think that that's too late, that you should really use 2007, which is when e-cigarettes began being imported. Um, if we look at search interest for e-cigarettes, it's already increasing after 2007, before 2013. Um, and so that's, I think, uh, an argument in favor of 2013 being too late, that, you know, there was meaningful changes happening before 2013 that that maybe Alcon and Rafkin um, put in the pre-period, but should have been in the post-period. Um, I guess the second difference between us and them is, is that we use this, uh, this pre-trend procedure. Uh, so if you look at some of their figures in Alcott Rafkin, um, they basically use just a, a unit level linear trend, but, but we think that this procedure is maybe a little bit, uh, cleaner in our models, uh, than, than just a, a linear trend, which, which might, uh, soak up actual variation happening from the treatment effect. So those are really the two major differences, I'd say. Great. Um, Jamie, happy to kick it back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Mike is doing an amazing job answering the questions in real time on the Q&A. So I'm going to suggest for the interest of time, Christian, you press ahead. If those questions are still outstanding at the end and we have time to get to them, I will get to them. But thank you, Mike, for doing such a brilliant job. And over to you, Christian. All right. Thank you. Uh, so let's look at our main event study uh, results. Uh, so here, panel A, we have uh, NRT. Panel B, we have e-cigarette introduction. Uh, as a reminder, over-the-counter NRT uh, happened in 1996. E-cigarettes uh, happened in 2007. And so what we find here is that uh, we find no statistical evidence of of mortality rates changing uh, following NRT introduction uh, on average. But for uh, e-cigarette introduction, we find that uh, that we have parallel trends that prior to 2007 mortality uh, across groups that smoke relatively uh, more compared to those who smoke relatively less that mortality trended parallel for these groups. Uh, and then after 2007, we see that uh, mortality for groups that have higher smoking rates tended to uh, decline over time. And we see really no major uh, movement happening uh, prior to 2010, but after that we start to see a, a real consistent decline in mortality uh, for those groups that smoke more. Um, and so to interpret our average effect, um, so we estimate that for every one percentage point increase in the daily smoking rate in, in 2005 and six, that uh, mortality per 100,000 fell by around 15.47 deaths uh, or around a one point, uh, around a 1% decline in mortality for every one percentage point increase in the smoking, uh, daily smoking prevalence. Uh, prior to e-cigarettes. And so the takeaway here is that um, we don't see any significant effect of, of uh, mortality changing uh, after NRT, uh, but we find that e-cigarettes did uh, reduce mortality. Uh, and so we think that this uh, decline in mortality might be due to smoking cessation. Um, and so let's look at how uh, smoking rates are also impacted now. Uh, and so here, instead of mortality, we have uh, smoking prevalence as our outcome. And so on the left, we have NRT intro. On the right, we have uh, NRT intro, but for heavy smoking. Uh, so current and heavy smoking. And we see overall that NRT... Uh, no significant effect on, on smoking prevalence, uh, either current or heavy smoking. For e-cigarettes, we find that uh, that current smoking did decline uh, significantly. 
So every one percentage point increase in the daily smoking rate uh, prior to 2007, uh, after 2007, uh, the current smoking rate declined by around 1.21%. Uh, for heavy smoking, it's around a 0.93% uh, decline on average. Now, there is something weird happening in 2011 and 12 here, uh, and, and we think that this is because the Burfists changed their sampling design and started uh, using uh, cell phones. And, and so if you're wondering what that weird blip is, uh, that we think that's because of uh, the change in sample design, um, but not a whole lot we can do about that. Uh, and so the takeaway from, from those uh, results is that we don't find any uh, evidence that NRT um, over-the-counter uh, reduced uh, smoking, uh, but we do find that smoking uh, cessation increased after e-cigarettes became available. Um, daily smoking rates fell by 0.93% uh, for every one percentage point increase in uh, per difference in the daily smoking rate. So um, let's look now at our main estimates, but by age. Uh, and so uh, we had our main estimate from before um, in percentage terms uh, in the top row here, it's around uh, a 1% reduction uh, in, in mortality across people over the age of 30 um, overall. But by age, we see that most of this mortality reduction is uh, for people uh, between the ages of 45 and 59. Uh, as well as some evidence of people over the age of 75. Uh, also, um, their mortality also uh, decreasing. And we find no such effect for over-the-counter NRT. Uh, and so here we have our main results uh, in percent changes uh, in the top row. This is just for the whole sample over the age of 30, our preferred specification. Uh, but we do a number of robustness checks too. Uh, so we try uh, using unweighted regressions. We use a five-year bite, uh, which is what the Alcott Rafkin paper does. Uh, we require over a thousand survey respondents. We use a national bite, bootstrapped standard errors, and we see overall that that our results are are pretty consistent. Uh, it doesn't really matter what we throw at them. They, we seem to keep finding uh, this, this reduction in, in mortality after e-cigarettes. Uh, lastly, so, so far we've um, been looking at all-cause mortality, but if it's true that, that, that e-cigarettes are reducing mortality because people are quitting smoking, then what we should find is that the causes of death that should most be impacted, be most impacted by smoking cessation, that those causes should decrease the most. Uh, and so here we look at uh, how mortality for smoking attributable causes changes, uh, as well as cardiovascular uh, or heart mortality changes uh, after e-cigarette introduction. Uh, and the reason we look at heart is that, that this is one of the smoking attributable causes that is most immediately responsive to, to smoking cessation. Uh, and we look at these uh, categories using only the underlying cause of death, as well as any line uh, underlying or contributing cause of death. Uh, and so we have our result for all cause mortality on the top row around a 1% uh, reduction. Uh, for smoking attributable, we find around a 1.5 to 2% reduction in mortality. Uh, for heart, uh, we find an even larger uh, decline. Uh, so in the last row, when we just use underlying cause heart mortality, we see almost uh, between a three and a 4% reduction in mortality uh, for every one percentage uh, point increase in the smoking rate. Uh, and so we think that this evidence is is consistent with um, with smoking cessation is what seems to be driving these uh, reductions in mortality. Uh, lastly, we do calculations about consumer surplus. 
and I may, uh, for the sake of time, skip through the the nitty gritty of how we do this. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions about it. But uh, it's so our bottom line conclusion here is that uh, that e-cigarettes generated over 173 billion dollars uh, in consumer surplus uh, from 2007 to 2019. Um, and we estimate this is around $13.3 billion annually uh, each year after 2007. Uh, and we estimate this based on our results for how mortality uh, decreased. Uh, and so this is the implied um, consumer surplus from, from the effects that we uh, observe. So let me uh, conclude. So we started off talking about how uh, FDA drug regulation uh, could have this unintended consequence of, of reducing innovation and, and diminishing uh, consumer surplus. Uh, if, if compounds take 15 years to come to market, you know, there could be people that might benefit from, the, from a faster approval process. Uh, in this study, we want to uh, say something about you know, what is the impact of, of this kind of FDA regulation? Uh, and so we look at one particular uh, drug, e-cigarettes, uh, which uh, uniquely managed to escape FDA uh, drug regulation uh, and were virtually unregulated at the federal level for almost a decade. Uh, and we compare how e-cigarettes impacted mortality to a more uh, traditional uh, tobacco product, NRT, uh, which has been very heavily regulated from the start uh, since the 1980s. And our uh, results show that e-cigarettes uh, saved uh, 1.6 uh, uh, million life years uh, from 2007 to 2019 uh, and generated over uh, 173 billion in consumer surplus. Uh, and we think our our results are important um, because they suggest that that FDA drug regulation might be too restrictive uh, and that deregulation uh, could lead to public health gains. Um, our study also suggests that if the FDA Center for Tobacco Products is successful in clearing the e-cigarette marketplace uh, of all but 23 authorized products, this could have the unintended consequence of offsetting uh, mortality reduction gains that that e-cigarettes have been providing uh, for the past 10 years. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. We have 12 minutes now, so I'm going to hand over to our discussant one last time and then move over to questions from the audience. Thanks, Jamie. Um, now, this is really interesting. Great, great work, Christian and, and Mike. Um, and, and thanks to Mike for all the responses in the Q&A. Um, I, I, I wonder uh, if we could get some sense of how how believable the, the um, 1.6 million life years is. Um, there exist a lot of uh, epidemiology models and economic models. I've done one on the long-term longevity effects of smoking. And so I, I wonder if you took like a variety of those models and you just kind of simulated those models under differences in smoking behavior, if you would get a similar answer. Um, so you take a model, you get everybody to quit at age 50, you get everybody to quit at age 60, make some assumptions about how bad e-cigarettes are for you. But would, would, that I think that would be a helpful way of kind of connecting your paper with the... Um, with the literature, um, because in in, in 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 without that connection, this this seems like a big number, but I, I don't know how uh, how believable it is. Uh, I think what we're relying on here is just the kind of the the pre trends treatments that you've that you've you've discussed quite a bit. Um, uh, I don't know. Have you tried anything like that? Have you thought about anything like that? So, like a structural type model. Is what it doesn't. It, it doesn't have to be a. It doesn't have to be a structural economic model. I mean, there exist epidemiology models that try to forecast uh, changes in 
health and longevity on the basis of changes in smoking. Um, they go about them in very different ways, but uh, you know, I, I think the point is that there are a variety of models out there that you could choose. And it would be nice to kind of uh, couch your results in that literature. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, we we haven't tried any of those types of models yet. Um, the models that we showed today for our reduced form difference in difference, that's, that's what we've done so far. Um, but that's certainly something that we could try to explore in the future. Uh, I, and I agree that would, I think make our social welfare results, maybe a little more persuasive if, if we're able to, to show that they're robust to that. So that's something we can try. Um, one other question, just, it's a, it's a really interesting contrast here, I think, between the fact that, you know, this is, you're in, a, in a sense, you're kind of exploiting the unregulated nature of, um, of e-cigarettes. But, but when something is unregulated, it also opens up the opportunity for the, the companies who produce these things to target specific demographic groups. Um, and and we've certainly seen that with e-cigarettes. So I, I wonder to what extent the the kind of identification argument here kind of undermines itself in the sense that uh, the the companies would be targeting, for example, young young uh, potential future tobacco users. Uh, I understand that you throw out people age thirty and under, but um, the broader point is that these companies construct advertising to, to for specific groups and 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 your your argument is that the difference between specific groups is what is what pins down these these causal effects yeah that's a great point um i i think i understand what you're saying that that these younger people that might live for another 40 50 years that e-cigarette companies are targeting uh their products uh to them um yeah i it's a it's a good point. I, I don't know how we would try to disentangle that. Um, you know, one one option I guess would be that we could maybe control for for age group fixed effects, and, and then try to estimate. Okay, within people between the age of thirty and fifty, but who are of a different race ethnicity who live in the South versus the West, we could try to look at within age group differences in smoking prevalence and we might because all those people in the same age group are targeted by the companies but but for other reasons other than age they might have different smoking rates and so that um that might be one way to try to get at what you're what you're asking about yeah i mean i think it's just an interesting problem if you if you think that differences in demographic groups are what identify it the absence of regulation, but you know, where where whereas the absence of regulation allows these companies to target different demographic groups, um, and so I I think that's something worth exploring, like you've discussed. So, um, Jamie, I'll I'll kick it back to you. Great, thank you so much, Michael and Christian. So we have a question or a few questions in the Q and A. I'll start with this one from Lindsay Rosen who writes, how would you respond to those who advocate for more regulation due to fears of youth initiation who were never smokers? It would be interesting to look at potential life years lost for youth who initiate e-cigarettes and experience adverse health effects under less regulations despite gains for current smokers. Yeah, that, that's an important question. And, and it's not uh, as simple as saying that e-cigarettes uh, are good or bad. I mean, they can be beneficial for some people, uh, but we obviously know that that youth, uh, at least, were using them historically at very high rates. Um, I I don't know that we take a position on on um, we we don't necessarily take a position on, on how uh, we should regulate um, e cigarettes. What we do in the paper is uh, we ask the question of of uh, if e-cigarettes were regulated by the FDA, um, which they weren't, um, how might that have impacted uh, mortality? And we find that that the fact that e-cigarettes were available uh, and were not subject to regulation, that 
that they conferred a lot of public health benefits. Uh, and, and so most of our paper is spent trying to document these, these effects and trying to persuade the reader that, that e-cigarettes really had this, this impact. Um, but we don't, other than saying that deregulation uh, might be uh, optimal, we, we don't really take a position beyond that. Okay, thank you. And I know in the Q&A, um, two other people have commented on that as well for anyone who wants to take a look. Um, another question here, how do you define heavy smoking counties? Did they switch or change over time? In other words, did places considered heavy smoking counties in earlier years switch to less smoking counties? And they note this is important because smoking rates have been declining over time and based on local state level policies, there could be differential decreases in smoking across counties. Um, so we don't, we don't define counties. We, yeah, we don't define counties. We calculate the smoking prevalence across different groups, uh, demographically. So by age, by gender, by whether you live in an urban versus a rural county, um, by census region. Uh, and so we calculate smoking rates for groups of people, not for counties. Um, so I, I think I might not have understood the question, but I think that that's what we do. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, in the absence of more questions and in the absence of much more time, I'm gonna hand over to our MC, Sam now. Okay, so now that we're out of time, uh, if you still have any burning questions or thoughts for Christian Signs, you can join us for Top of the Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following Select Tops events this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once this event concludes. We'll leave this webinar room open for an extra minute after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL, which is bit.ly slash tops meeting. That is B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash tops meeting all lowercase. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 201 people for your participation. Have a tops notch weekend. <laughs>